What if you or someone you loved was ill, but no one, not even your doctor, knew what was wrong? Or even worse, what if no one believed you? Well, this is a situation people with rare diseases and their families face every day. They could spend years searching for answers and finding none. Some are even accused of faking their symptoms or trying to gain the medical system. And for some, this search lasts a lifetime. People facing rare diseases are coming together to share their stories and to amplify their voices. And their voices are being heard by governments, by drug companies, by hospital systems, insurers, and by the physicians, nurses, and others on the front lines of human health. While each family's situation is unique, they all share the hope for a better future. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Welcome to Rare in Common. My two oldest boys have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Bella has Morchio syndrome. Ryan has Sturge Weber syndrome. I have two girls. Both of them have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Dane, his disease was osteogenesis imperfecta, also known as brittle bone disease. I feel like the, the home of the misfit toys. You know, we all feel really isolated from the rest of the world because no one understands. It's hard to raise children. It's even harder to raise children that are dying. The thing is, there's over 7,000 diagnosed rare diseases and we still don't even have a hole to put Luke's peg. Like a me. Like the king of the world. Just give it a name. Just give it something. I don't care what you name it, just give it something. So then we have something. Ryan was diagnosed um, at birth, official diagnosis at six months of age. When Ryan was born, he was born with a massive put wine stain that covered his eyelid to the back of his head. We were told at the time it could be Sturge Weber, it might not be, but they did not want to put him in an, eye, in an MRI until he was six months old. So we got the official diagnosis when he was six months old. And Ryan had his first seizure at nine months old. A complex care doctor said, the heart's a pretty big muscle. All his muscles seem to be affected by this. Let's check the heart. Well, when they did the echo, not, they found three major things wrong, that at two and a half, you know, so we didn't know, until the age of two and a half, we didn't know they had any cardiac problems. They first, they said he has a dilated aortic root, and then he said something about the mitral valve prolapse, that be being floppy like the rest of them. And then he's like, well, and there's one more thing. And he says, found this pretty big hole between the ventricles. When Bella was born, she had pretty bad reflux. They kept putting her on different formulas and she was growing normal for probably the first year. And then after that, her growth slowed down. So by the time she was just over two, her GI doctor suggested that we take her to a geneticist with the diagnosis of Chiari malformation, tethered spinal cord, and with her teeth falling out, uh, I was started to do my homework, like most rare parents, and I got online, and I joined a few groups, and I started to see that she had a lot of the comorbidities of the, a disease called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And I googled oral manifestations of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and it was right there, aggressive periodontitis, and that's what Olivia had. Mm -hmm. Most people with Ellis Danlos are diagnosed with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, lupus, MS, or it's in your head. So I finally actually asked the pediatrician when I was sitting there waiting for them to do the neurology exam again for another concussion, for another fall. That was a stupid fall. I said, when are you gonna report me to Child Protective Services? And I was hugely pregnant with his brother at the time. And she said, you know, he does fall a lot. He's really clumsy. And so she said, you know what? Maybe we can get him some services so we can make him not so clumsy. I'm gonna send a physical therapist out. And of course it took six months <laughs> to get a physical therapist. So uh, by the time I saw a physical therapist, um, the baby was almost three months old and Austin was three, a little over three. And this physical therapist, Diana, I will, I will never forget her because she watched him and then she watched him get up off the floor and he crawled up himself when he stood up. And she said, does he always do that? I said, yeah, that's how he gets up. She had him sit down, get up again. He 
called up himself. She's, it's called the Gowers Maneuver. I said, great, the heck's that mean? And she said, that means we need to have him evaluated for, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It got big, they are. Those are big. Can you learn how to use them? Yes. I can do everything. From the first fall, he was 14 months. And then the last break that we dealt with in Alaska, he was 23 months. It was right before his second birthday. In that span of a time, he had six broken bones. We don't count fingers and toes. My husband and I were begging for them to test him. The orthopedics pretty much told us that there's no way um, it could be anything disease-wise as far as his bones because we didn't have it. So. We were being refused, you know, no, we don't need tests. You know, he's fine, it's normal. Some kids just, you know, they fall, they break. Um, some kids don't bounce. You know, they'd always kind of joke about it a little bit. And um, the last straw was they told us that he just had bad luck. We decided to move from Alaska to Rhode Island in search of better doctors and basically just to find answers. Our doctor verbally diagnosed him. She was actually able to take one look at him and know right away that he had brittle bone. She saw the features that none of us had ever noticed before. Is this a high up here? I'll put it on the way. Oh, man. We were kind of prepared for the answer, but it was, it was nice hearing it. You kind of move forward. <laughs> We were stuck for a really long time, not knowing what to do and just kind of holding your breath, waiting for the next bone. So his geneticist completely believes that they found a new connective tissue disorder and there might be a treatment, which nobody's ever said that to us before. And after We've... being at Children's since six months, it's been three and a half years, and to get the phrase possible treatment. With some research. Like, yeah, it may be nothing, but. For us, yeah, it was For like... us, after, after three and a half years of like, appointment after appointment, like one, one department after another, now we're into, well, now he's up to about, what, 18 separate departments? And to finally get the possible treatment phrase was... Hopefully some drug company will like, pick it up and do the like, research was on it. And they said there is a med that they're using now with Marfan syndrome that could possibly work the Luke. So that was like... I said, you don't understand, my birthday is tomorrow. You just gave me the best gift. That was like pretty awesome. She's being tuggy. She wants to move. My boys have been in a, in a, a few different clinical trials. My younger son, Max, was given the opportunity um, about four and a half years ago now to participate in an actual drug trial. We got lucky. We got picked 12 boys across the entire country. Max is still on his feet at 14. He should have come off his feet between 8 and 12. We don't know how long it'll prolong his, his walking function, but any, you know, you walk longer, you live longer, basically. So, you know, at 14, he shouldn't be walking at least for the last two years. So he looks great. And Austin was actually given the opportunity when they expanded the trial to include non-ambulant kits. He's now been on the drug for a year. Both boys are still terminal. Um, we hope that this has extended their lives and sort of paused the progression to start stacking other drugs. And, and also, this is a first-generation drug. Again, you know, I can't, I can't explain enough how lucky we feel. Um, the boys that Max knew that were the same age as him are all in wheelchairs now. You know, I mean, and Austin's friends are having back surgery um, because they have scoliosis, because their muscles can't support their backs. Um, you know, and, and some of the kids Austin's age are dying. His treatments are, they're every six weeks. It takes about six hours, six to eight hours for the whole 
um, med to run through. It's not to make him stronger, not to heal him, make him better. The big idea with it is to slow things down. So far, it's been incredible. It's changed our world. I'm about four treatments in to where I didn't cry. The better he's getting at it, I guess the stronger I'm getting at it. He's a very heavily medicated child to keep the seizures at bay. We have had a few serious incidents of seizure activity, prolonged seizure activity. When he was four years old, my husband was actually deployed at the time. He was in Kuwait and um, Ryan, we just completely lost control of his seizures and we actually started down the hemispherectomy path. Mm -hmm. But remarkably enough, uh, Dan came home <laughs> and we managed to get his seizures back in order and um, he's very heavily medicated though. And then I was deployed again in 2011 uh, to Iraq. Uh, and of course that presents all the normal challenges in, in a healthy family, right? So, but it, it was always in the back of my mind, like, oh God, is that gonna happen again, you know? Cause sometimes I felt like it was my fault, right? I mean, it's, and you, sometimes you can't think like that, but I did and I'm human, right? So that's what you kind of, that's what we do, especially as parents. And I was just praying, you know, that wouldn't happen again, you know. Bella was born without an enzyme, so it's a progressive disorder that affects her bone growth and her organs. Um, her brain is not affected, but every other organ or system is. The medicine became FDA approved in February of 2014. Between her starting the medication and the time when she got George, the benefits of both together were noticed at around the same time. Up at Service Dog Project, every Sunday afternoon, they have what they call Sunday stew. So it's kind of like open house, anybody can go. When we first started going up there, Bella would go literally from kennel to kennel. And at times there's up to 60 dogs there. George was probably about four months. He was just in the beginning of his training. After time with Bella visiting with George, when we would go in, he would go sit with her and Bella would brush him and give him treats. And eventually it came to the point where if Bella tried to get up, he's sticking his paw on top of her. Like, nope, you can't go anywhere. They want the dog to pick the person. And then we got a call saying, oh, we're gonna, you know, do a trial run with George, you know, for a day. So we picked him up on a Sunday. They hung out in the yard playing and having fun and Bella with her pocket full of treats. Um, and it kind of just evolved from there. He actually forces her to walk. So where she holds on to him, she doesn't have the choice to just swing her legs. She has to walk normally. Um, well, now I can go places and do stuff without a wheelchair. So I like having more independence. She'll grab George and she can walk a couple hours at the mall and she'll be fine. So just seeing her stamina increase so much since she's had George, has been amazing. We'll go to the local pub or something for, for dinner and people will say, oh, how's Bella and George doing? The two of them are like Batman and Robin running around the countryside. I was very big on maintaining, you know, my relationship with my son as his mother. And so I do very little caregiving. Not to mention he's 130 pounds and he doesn't like lifts. So um, in order to get him in and out of the shower, it's a slippery, slippery subject, you know? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried to lift a full adult human, <laughs> but it's not easy. And it's, um, it's not something I wanted to be a part of. I also had other kids and it takes away a lot from them if I were to be a caregiver. Patrick works for me full time. He is a PCA, he does all of their personal care, he does their hospital visits, he's their buddy, he'll sit and play chess. 
They have a great time at Infusion every week. Austin and Max are both at the hospital for an entire day every week. And I couldn't work if I didn't have caregivers. So they really do become um, part of your family. They're somebody you lean on. What I find to be very, it's like how it affects relationships. Um, there is no going out to dinner because it's not like you can just call anybody to watch your kid. It's none of that. Um, everything's a, a plan. Um, we work completely opposite shifts to coordinate care. When we go to work, that's our downtime. <laughs> like when, when we come here, it's like, all right, going home. Gonna I, gonna, I have gonna murderers jump that now. I take care of. I have murderers and level threes, and it's like, all right, I'm going to work. <laughs> it's you, you're up. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's some days it's easier to be at work than it is to, to be here. I have friends that won't watch Dane. I've had people tell me, no, I could never live with myself if anything happened to him. And it actually wasn't until my friend, my first friend turned me down for that, you know, she told me, you know, flat out, I don't trust myself watching him. I don't feel comfortable. I don't, I would never be able to live with myself. And I never realized that what I was asking, I guess, when, do you mind watching him? I guess you don't realize what you're, what you're asking. She's one person that you don't have to flinch an eye or worry about when your children's with them. You don't worry about a thing when they're with grandma. I know he has, has a disease. Um, but for the most part, I don't treat him any different than anybody else. Um, I refuse to do that. As you can tell, I mean, if you didn't know him, it, he would never know he had a problem. But does my heart stop every time he falls? Oh, yeah. We were worried about what was going to happen when Olivia got to college. In the beginning, I was coming here every single time. She would call me up and say, my ribs are out. When her rib is out, I can actually slide my thumbs down her back, and I can, now I can. I couldn't before, I used to have to have her tell me which one. I, I'm, I'll be like, is this the one? You know, I was so proud of myself the first time I figured out, this is the one, this is the one that's out, isn't it? And then there's like a manipulation that I do to fix it. When Olivia turned 18 and the doctors started saying, we need to talk to Olivia, we can't talk to you. I started to realize that I can't be who I was to her anymore. And it's tough, uh, you know, I'm her only caregiver. What happens when I'm not here anymore? So every year, uh, we go into Ryan's classroom during Sturge Weber Awareness Month, the month of May, and we bring in a bunch of coloring books. And so it's Color Me Different is the title of the book, and it, and it basically profiles a kid who moved to a new neighborhood, and he has a port wine stain, and he has a seizure disorder, and it's age appropriate. These books are a great little resource that we use and distribute to all the kids, and we give them the Sturge Weber bracelets. It helps the kids. That be more aware, right? So now they're, if they have, if they hear that two or three times in their grammar school, maybe when they hit junior high and they see a child with a port wine stain, or a peer with a port wine stain, maybe they'll remember that. Well, that might be Sturge Weber. We do a walk for Children's Hospital and our team is called Team Limitless. I'll meet moms and they'll be telling me about their child. I'll say, do you want to, here's the email address. Walk with us, walk with us because we're the only team in the past three years to represent genetics. And you know what? The answer is going to come through that door. When my boys were diagnosed 14 years ago, nobody was really looking at Duchenne beyond the mice models. Like, we used to have this, this saying, like, you know, we've cured an awful lot of freaking mice with Duchenne. However, it was never in children. Um, so if approved, this drug would be the first approved therapy for Duchenne. But I can tell you that probably in 2016, we'll have three to four approved therapies that can be used together. We have what's called the Duchenne Alliance, which is an alliance of international organizations, these little mom and pop organizations like ours, that get together and have a very big voice together. You know, there's a lot of 
organizations that are fundraising for seed research, we realized that nobody was lobbying for approval. Like, what do you do with a drug that's, that's met its milestones and gotten to the end and then it doesn't get approved? The work that I do for, you know, Rare Disease United, I love doing, I love helping people. It makes me feel like I have control over something that I have absolutely no control over. Rare diseases cost this country $500 billion a year. 30 million people, more people than AIDS and cancer combined. This is a health crisis. Studying rare diseases leads to better treatments for more common diseases. It's a win-win. Having a rare disease in your family doesn't need to define you. It doesn't need to take over your life. If you still want to just be a librarian, just be a librarian. If you want to advocate and you feel the drive to advocate, advocate. You don't have to be Superman. You don't have to be super mom. You don't have to be a martyr. You know, life makes you what kind of advocate you are. Would have been easy for me to sit back and say, my boys are being treated. Um, it was actually Austin who told me that that wasn't an option. Uh, you know, when I was fighting to get him on the drug too, that was benefiting his brother, he said to me, well, so I'm gonna get the drug. I said, yeah, hands down, you're getting the drug. And he says, okay. What about my friend? I said, what do you mean? Well, he's more progressed than I am, so could you do him first? I think one of the greatest attributes about Ryan is that he has the biggest heart mm -hmm. of anyone we know. He's so selfless. I think he's the most courageous little boy that I've ever seen in my life. He's more has more courage than I'll ever have in a lifetime. You can always find a way to do stuff no matter what. Like, I can't ice skate, but I still want to find a way to do it. We're gonna have to get ice skates for George then. She's love personified. I could never withstand what she's been through and still continue to have the outlook that she does. He's, he's so, Precious. He's just so happy. He's fun. He's not a problem. It just is a problem. As people, generally things that are rare, we put the highest value on. So, you know, if living with rare is, you know, someone with you know, disability like Bella supposedly has, then she's extra special. It's just who she is.